Hi, everyone. Just giving a moment to file in. Welcome. Um, so happy to see you all here. Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 536th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, the program's assistant here at the rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Jordan Nassar and Dan Cameron. We're also thrilled to welcome poet Elizabeth Robinson here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions. And over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey bringing together in a single monthly publication, art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with thoughtful social and political meditations, not to mention our new social environment program. As a small nonprofit, we need your support and your contribution will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and all of our operations here at the rail. Um, so please check the chat in a moment just for more information and for links to donate. And now to introduce our guest and host. Through hand embroidery, wood inlay, glass, and expansive installations, Jordan Nassar examines issues of identity, diaspora, and cultural participation. His work has been featured in solo and groups ex exhibitions globally, and he is the recipient of the 2021 Unbound United States Artists Fellowship in Craft. His upcoming solo exhibition at the ICA Boston will open August 11th in 2022. Dan Cameron is a New York-based curator, art writer, and educator whose career was launched in 1982 with extended sensibilities at the New Museum, the first institutional effort in the U.S. to examine gay and lesbian identity in art. Over, for over 40 years, Cameron has held senior positions, senior curatorial positions at the New Museum, Orange County Museum of Art, and CAC New Orleans, along with more than 100 museum exhibitions, including surveys of Martin Wong, David Wanarovich, Faith Ringgold, Carolee Schneeman, Peter Saul, and Paul McCarthy. Um, thank you all for tuning in today. Um, I would now love to turn the mic over to Dan and to Jordan to begin our event. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Eleanor, uh, and welcome, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to be joining you and to be able to uh, have the opportunity to talk um, with Jordan Nassar today. Um, first of all, I hope everyone is okay. I know there's been a, a bit of a shock for New Yorkers, especially people uh, based in Brooklyn. Um, so I hope um, everyone is okay and that your loved ones are, are, are doing fine uh, in the process. And um, Jordan, uh, speaking of where people are, uh, I guess maybe the best way to start the conversation is by allowing people to get a little bit of a a look at where you are, uh, because you know what's behind you, the settings of your studio where, where you're coming to us from, uh, the details are just so eye grabbing. Uh, and so I think it would be nice if we could just start by uh, getting you to talk a little bit about where you're, where you're sitting uh, today uh, for this conversation. Um, I guess start with hi and thanks for having me. Um, I am in my studio in Gowanus, uh, which is, um, I have like a pretty big studio with some studio mates that we share and we each have a couple little rooms. So this room is my kind of like uh, cozy embroidering room. So I usually sit here at the desk where I am. I have all my, balls of thread uh, laid out in as close as I can maintain like color organ organized uh, and, you know, kind of all laid out so I can kind of like 
see where the specific shades I'm looking for are or whatever, um, which as you mentioned, is very fun to look at. Everyone always loves that, um, but it really is just, fun. it's functional. Um, and yeah, and this is kind of just, you know, my desk here and there's a couch, you can hang out and um, sometimes sitting in one chair gets painful on the back. So like changing posture, going to the couch and embroidering there for a while or whatever. Um, and like have a piece I'm working on here. Um, Ooh, could, yeah. could we see that a little bit more? Uh, I mean, so this is, um, I mean, for, you know, for people to see how you work, I think would be a will great be, way to... This will be a panel that goes in a piece similar to the pieces in the show in, at James Cohen right now, where there's exactly. panels that I embroider of landscape, and then there are panels embroidered in Palestine of patterning, of just like just patterning. Um, so this is one of the panels that, you know, it's, I'm almost there. I'm like three quid, there's just like, it kind of ends here. So there's like some more colors down here that will be in the future. It's just a lot of sky on this one. Um, but yeah, and you can see it's literally just rolled up until the point where I'm working on um, needle and thread. And the back, you can see how neat and organized it is. Um, <laughs> I just show that because once they're stretched, they're stretched over another canvas and you'll never see the back. So it's a sneaky sneak peek to see the back. Um, well, I just learned something now, which is that the landscape elements in the larger pieces are your handiwork yes. and the patterns um, that, that surround them or that, that are around them, they're made with by your um, collaborators. Right. So basically, I'm, you know, I'm embroidering the same patterns that they are technically, but I'm disregarding the elements of the pattern and doing kind of landscapes across it, whereas they're doing like a flower one color, the outline of the flower another color, like the traditional way of applying color to these patterns. Um, and these are, the, you know, this is part of the process in works that I do that are collaborative with women in Palestine, because there are other works that I do that are not collaborative and I'm just making the whole thing myself. So there's kind of multiple ongoing bodies of work and some of them are collaborative and some of them aren't. Um, and some of them are happening in other rooms right now while we're talking. <laughs> I, I wish I wish I had a factory. Um, no, but uh, the, you know, the ones in Palestine are really like, um, the way the collaborations work is that I'll design the piece. Basically, this is what it looks like. So this is the pattern that I'm following for that right now. And basically, so I'll, I'll lay it out on Illustrator in black and white. And then for a landscape, I'll draw, as you can see, just with pencil, my composition. Oh, yeah. And then, and the colors don't matter what color pencil I used or whatever, it's just for the, the lines. And then I'll assign colors to that and like start at the top and just start going. Um, but when I send them to Palestine, let's say I wanted them to embroider this whole thing as traditional patterning. Um, I might give them a few colors like, ask them to do this one in like red and black and blue but i'll never i'll never dictate which part of the pattern should be uh -huh. i always leave that up to them and and when i mean now we've been doing this for a long time so they just do their thing but in the beginning they kind of were like because usually they're doing commissions for people that are very specific um and so i used to always just tell them to do it palestinian style meaning that doesn't really mean anything, but I think for them, they would just do it in whatever way they might normally do the pattern um, in terms of like how to divide it up. Because in a pattern, like this is a very simple pattern, but like it's very, uh, there's only one element, this flower, but you can do the whole flower one color, or you can do the kind of border of the flower one color and the fill of the flower another color, or you can do each petal a different color within that, or you can do like pinwheel, like two petals, the same color, two petals. So there's a lot of options of like how to apply the color. And also like in some of the pieces in the James Cohan show, this pattern appears. And in some of them, they end up doing like a diagonal where it's like one color and then a different color and then a different color and then a different color. And so it becomes and like- And they split diagonal. the flowers. The, the, the color arrangement splits the flowers. Sort it of can. like half the I mean, flower. Really, there's, in cases in there's, if you look, throughout the collaborative pieces I've made over the past like three years, this mm -hmm. pattern appears regularly and there's many different versions of how it's been, how it's been divided and how many colors are used to make it up. Um, and that's, for me, that's the fun of doing the collaboration is because, you know, when I do a work 
by myself, I have complete control over what it's going to look like. So doing the collaborations are a way of like giving some of that, uh, those aesthetic decisions to someone else. And then when I receive the work back from them, what they've done will dictate then like what I want to do for my part that is like goes within it. Usually they're like empty here. Actually, I have one right here. So this is one that just came back from Palestine. Ah, and so, so then you decide they, the palette. You you pick the specific colors loosely, but it's like loosely. exact shades and stuff is just going to be about like what they have there. So um, we're not talking Pantone numbers here. No, 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 no. Oh, it's no, much no. more uh, organic and old fashioned than that, I guess. But so this piece is pretty big, but so they wow. found their part, and when I sent the pattern to them. I basically deleted this part from the pattern they see so that now when it comes back to me, the next step is for me to fill in this part with the same pattern, just continue the pattern, but I'll do it with a landscape instead of as they've done it with like just the colors according to the pattern. Okay. Uh, so that's what that looks like before I've done my part when it's fresh back from Palestine. Um, and again, I had no idea that they were going to do this checkerboard kind of thing. And I had no, like in terms of the colors, like they could have done vertical lines of the same colors and then it'll give it a different look, or they could have done whole horizontal lines, one color each, and then that would have given a different look. They could have done brown here instead of here and done pink there. Like all those decisions were up to them. And what comes back to me is what will then dictate what colors I want to highlight in my part and what colors I want to use less or like, you know what I mean? Like how, how to play off the background that they've basically given me right. with the landscape. Now, would someone with a better understanding, with a better historical understanding of embroidery uh, as an art form, be able to look at your patterns and I don't know, read them, decode them, say, well, well, this is the something, something pattern. And it was first used in the 14th century. You know, I, I, mean, I, I get the feeling that I'm missing a whole lot of, um, you know, basic connoisseurship. I'm sure there are like anything. historians that would be able to tell you that. I feel like many Palestinians, especially women, would, women, because most women, I feel like are exposed and taught how to do this whether they end up doing it as an adult or not depends on the person but I feel like most women at some point from their mother or grandmother like are given a sh shot at it you know and uh so I I I assume that most Palestinian women would recognize these patterns and they they'll know they'll know the patterns for sure and like may, might even know the names of some of them or um I mean that's the whole thing is that there are patterns that are specific to specific villages right. or regions, but there are also patterns that are found in a lot of places around Palestine, but have different names in different villages for the same thing. And like that, so there's a lot of like nuance and subtlety within that, but there, the patterns that I'm using largely are quite recognizable to a Palestinian as like a Palestinian. Embroidery. So there are appropriations on your part, flat out. You're- well, your take about no, the fact you're that adapting I, him. <laughs> well, it's, it's about the fact that, like, as a Palestinian American, they're part of my cultural heritage. But then sure. the fun part about it is, like, I'm doing it like wrong by like doing landscapes and stuff through it. So in a okay. sense, it's a little bit of a um, it's embracing it's the even fact more that I'm not, it's embracing the fact that I'm not like native to Palestine and that it's kind of. In a way, I, I, I think a lot about how, you know, trying to connect with your, you know, culture from like the, you know, the, the homeland or like the, where your family comes from is, I feel like really hard to do uh, perfectly. Like there are things that you, you know, sometimes- What I would mean, that even mean? <laughs> growing up as, you know, in the diaspora, it's like, you, the things that you, um, the things that you can access most easily as a member of a diaspora, doesn't have to be Palestinian, are usually tangible things you can like take with you, right? So it's craft items, 
food, and I would say also music. So those are like the things that are most easily accessible and become, in a sense, your whole cultural, like that's it, because you don't have the daily life and the way of life. So culture becomes boiled down to like those superficial, almost material things, right? That you can and, share with others. Right. But also, as I said, it's like, it's like, it's not everything. It's just the things that you can take with you somewhere else or exactly, replicate. Exactly, the portable stuff. Um, and so, and, and I also think that, you know, for example, like not, um, not being a native Arabic speaker, uh, like, you know, you can have an, you can grow up hearing the music and have an ear for and, and like the music, the sound of the music, but you're not going to understand it the same way <laughs> like a native speaker would ever understand it. Um, and I've done shows like I, the, my show that I had in 2019 at the third line in Dubai, um, all of the titles of, so basically the title of that show was called For Your Eyes. And it comes from um, the title of a song by Um Kulthum, which is like very famous singer in maybe the most famous singer of all time in the Middle East. And mm -hmm. um, she, and, and, and the, there's, a, there's a song called For Your Eyes. Um, and it's actually a, like an idiomatic expression, right? Um, meaning like, if someone asks you to do something and you say like, of course, for you, I'll do anything. It's that phrase, like for you, anything. For your eyes. But it just means, but, but it literally means for your eyes. And, um, the translations that I came across because so for this I also made a zine and like the zine had all these different translations of this title um be, and and there were just such variations in terms of like be, because of your eyes or like in the case of your eyes of like or all like you know there's all these versions that none of them are like actually what it, the idiomatic expression means and so you know I was thinking a lot about like I'll listen to Uncle Thum and feel like I'm connecting with Arab culture, but actually like I'm not understanding it. Even if I look up the words, I'm not understanding it. There's like always that disconnect. Even um, if you memorize the words and right. sing along. And that's kind of like a price of being a, a member of a diaspora, right? Um, and so that extends to everything where like for me, with my work, like I'm always learning the craft. I want to learn how to do the craft myself, right? So whether it's the embroidery or it's the glasswork or it's the wood inlay, all of which are traditional like Arab and Palestinian um, craft techniques, mm -hmm. it's about me doing it and like doing something Palestinian or like kind of trying to participate in that culture. But of course, you know, it kind of works because like as an artist, I want to put my own spin on it. And it works kind of conceptually because it's a comment on like, no matter how much I try, I'll never like do it the right way because I'm not, I wasn't raised there. And like, it's especially um, evident to me or it's most, uh, it's like, it's never more clear than when I'm in Palestine because when I'm here, I'm all like, hanging out with Arab friends and I'm like doing, you know, always cooking Arab food, Palestinian food and whatever, and listening to Arabic music. And I kind of am in my own world where it's like feels very Palestinian. But then when I go there, I'm like such an outsider. Like I'm so <laughs> obviously not from there and it's never gonna be any different. Like there doesn't, even if I live there for the rest of my life starting tomorrow, like it wouldn't matter. So like, you know, and this is, you know, I, 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 I do talk about Atel Adnan a lot, but um, one of the reasons that she, her life and work mean so much to me is because when I was just starting to make work, it was my um, impulse to kind of hide those things that are, that I feel not shame necessarily, but like that you feel like insecure about, right? Like I'm not a native right. Arab speaker or like I did, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm half Palestinian. So, you know, in a lot of ways I'm like, can feel like I'm not Arab enough and like whatever. Um, the vulnerabilities. And, and in, yes, and in, and in seeing and learning about her biography and learning about, she had very similar issues, different context. Like she was dealing with Lebanon and, and you know, the war and kind of self-imposed exile and all that kind of stuff. But, and also she happened to grow up in a non-Arabic speaking household. Um, she spoke Greek and Turkish with her parents and then 
uh, went to French school in, in Beirut, so in Lebanon. So she never really spoke Arabic natively. So she also had a thing about the Arabic language where she could read it as, as a child, like I could, um, but was never like a fluent native speaker and always felt not good and like not enough, not Arab enough out of that. But the important thing that I learned from her is she dug into that when she making her work and drew like that energy and power from that rather than trying to hide it and be ashamed and be like, you know, insecure about it. And that lesson, I feel like, I honestly feel like the minute I started making work about these insecurities rather than avoiding them is when I started, people wanted to show my work and I started to be able to like do this. Do you know what I mean? So I feel like it was an important lesson to learn. And that's why like, she'll have forever. She, I, I consider her a mentor, even though I never met her, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, anyway. Well, I'm, I'm interested. I mean, we're almost ready to go to the slides because I think everyone who's coming is as a right, but I did want to get, if you would just paint a picture for us briefly, sort of the transition between your art training and how you arrived at this present amalgam of, of techniques and ideas you know, because I, I think that there's there's a missing piece of the puzzle, I think, for for maybe some viewers in terms of your own uh, right. trajectory. Um, as well, artist, art, art training, I had none. I didn't go to art school. Um, I guess I was, I mean, the way that I, I always kind of tell it is that I was always just like into crafty things as a kid, like doing things with my hands. Partially, I'm just restless and like a busybody and need like something to do. Um, but when I was really young, like when I was like seven years old, I was like obsessed with origami. Like literally my mom would like bring me to like conventions. Like it was like hardcore origami. Origami uh, conventions. Yeah. And uh, there was one, I remember there was one at the Museum of Natural History cause I grew up in the Upper West Side. And uh, it was like a weekend long convention and like, I was the youngest person there, whatever. But, and then as I got older, I, I got into like weaving and, and you know, textile uh, weaving and crochet and all that kind of stuff and just like making things. Um, and so there was definitely always that like craft inclination. Um, and then, but in, in, in college, I studied like comparative grammar, like lots of languages and stuff. Like I wasn't doing art. And um, but, but a lot of thinking. It's sure. I actually just a lot of like chit chatting in different languages. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I was living in Berlin after I graduated from school, and it was kind of like the thing to do was art galleries. Like that's what every that was like. Uh, it was like two thousand eight. It was like everyone. It was like you just go to openings all the time and like. So, you know, I did this and that, you know, as one does where I took little random odd jobs and stuff, but um, eventually just like made the investment of taking an internship at a gallery. And that was my first exposure to like contemporary art in a real- May I ask which gallery? Um, I started at a gallery which became the gallery of Dietrich and Selectream, which is like still there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I moved to a gallery called Niels Borch Jensen, which is like really amazing, like print, like master prints where like oh, Niels, who's this God. printer in Denmark does really, really crazy prints um, where each exhibition that we would have in Berlin were like a print series that he would have made with an artist. And, oh, and we're talking like Olaf Erlius and Douglas Gordon, um, Tassada Dean, like major, it's like major artists. Um, and and he only did like really old fashioned prints, like etchings, monotypes, like this kind of stuff. Um, it's really cool. But um, but you know, so working in these jobs, I just started going to the art fairs all the time for work, like working the booth, like whatever, seeing lots of art, meeting lots of artists. Uh, I was, you know, these were small galleries, so I was also writing the press text, like just kind of understanding not only the business end of things, but also like how ideas become concepts become like explained in press text and kind of conceptualized and like done in a visual way and not you know like, like just get like understanding that process um and that's so, like graduate school that's yeah, like the, I mean that's essentially like the it was yeah it was essentially like and and honestly it was just like lots of googling like when people be like oh this reminds me of this and I'm like oh what's that and like you know and just learning over the years um 
and then you know at a certain point wanted to make something myself I guess and and it never like I don't know maybe as a as a kid I like never drew or painted I never felt like my hand like did what I wanted it to um and so maybe it was a combination of that and the inclination to craft and the interest in like wanting to connect to something Palestinian and like explore my relationship with my like culture. But for whatever reason, this kind of embroidery was like just like the first and most obvious thing to come to mind. And it's partially because this kind of embroidery is like, I feel like it's in every Palestinian's house around the world. They have something embroidered. embroidery. And if not- just Often like, made within the family? Would you say? Um, it depends no. how far you are. Collective. My family yeah. came to America a hundred years ago. So like we are pretty far away from like, I mean, my grandparents came from But there. you have stuff but, handed down. But we, we less that and more like my father went, has, you know, had been going to Palestine since at least the eighties as mm -hmm. with work, like doing medical work. Um, and so he started bringing stuff back. So before I was born, there would have already been like pillows that he would have brought back like as souvenirs like for the house and whatever um and but it's also just like in everyone's I mean all my cousins all my what I like everyone has some Palestinian embroidery and so it just really felt like visceral like this is Palestinian culture you know um and uh so yeah so that so I literally just like picked up a needle, needle and thread and like started doing it and learned a lot in the beginning in terms of like you know I bought a bunch of books like went uh and just like learned about the history of all the different patterns and the you know all that kind of stuff and then um it was around this time that I met who would be my husband and who's from Israel and so we started going there a lot and of course that to me was amazing because I had access I could go to Palestine and like do real research in real life and like buy historical like I have like historical dresses and stuff like that that I've bought in market in Jerusalem and stuff um or just even just buy lots of like stuff from the market made recent like you know pillows for sale and stuff like that sure. so um and yeah and just this whole time for the past basically decade just embroidering all the time and there was definitely a like learning curve in terms of just getting technically good enough at it that I could manipulate it like how I wanted. And that's where like the advent of this landscape thing came along. Cause at first I was doing more like minimalist abstract versions of this because I hadn't had the idea yet to like paint in that way. Um, and then, you know, the first time I did a landscape, it was basically like a technical, like, I wonder if I can make it look like that. Like I make it look like a mountain, you know what I mean? Like make it like, like what it would be like. And- um, Not, I wonder if I could do that and get away with it. I wonder if I can actually technically- Yeah, like I wonder this. if it would read, <laughs> if it would read like that, if right. I tried to like make this area one color and this area another color and like, would it read right? Um, well, you know, I think that might be, sorry, I didn't want to cut you up. I think this might be our cue to go see the show. I mean, oh, yeah, go, yeah. do a walk through, share the screen a little bit because now that you're getting into the landscape imagery, all right, do uh, we have a few images to look through, but. So yeah, these are, these, these first images are just images of the show that's up right now um, at James Cohan on Walker Street in Tribeca. Um, and these are like very, the work has come a long way since I started making landscapes essentially, where now these are quite large. They have multiple panels where some panels are landscapes, some panels are, you know, the patterns that I described being made in Palestine. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm very excited about this new step where I'm able to do much larger works because they're all different panels put together. But also what's fun about it for me, like one one added bonus is that the the separate panels can also become another layer of patterning where like how you arrange the different panels together becomes a pattern itself. Um, right, they can be the continuation of the same pattern or for a different pattern. Right. Like you see the green one on the left here is kind of asymmetrical, but then right. the next two follow more regular structures. 
Um, and actually the, the, the one all the way to the, to the right, the pink one is mm -hmm. the same rose pattern, the whole thing. Right, but even when it's one of your patterns, there's an identifiable landscape in each of these. Right, because that's ones. like the, that's like my thing. You know what I mean? Like that's, so part of the, honestly, like part of the way that the collaborations developed with the Palestinians is also that like, they would essentially supply a background color for my landscape to play off of, right? And that just moves to kind of being more about formal like color work, I suppose. Um, and like, okay, so for this one, for example, um, I, you know, I, and as I mentioned before, I chose the colors of the, of the panels that the Palestinian women painted. Um, but you can see here, I love this piece because it shows what happens when they choose to put different colors, different places. So if you look at the vertical panel on the right side and on the left side, Right. <laughs> they decided to do the like area Almost around the reverse. Sorry. Right. The area around each star, they chose to do black on the right side, but they chose to do the beige on the left side. And that really just changes the effect on the eye. Right. And so the, the top and bottom panels are also the same exact pattern, same exact colors, just rearranged where each color is. And same goes for those two small, like flowery side panels. And then no, and then and then having given them like a navy blue and a light green, I chose to make blue and green hills. Um, and then this beigey orange color that they used, I you know kind of relate the sun to that. And then this red mountain and the baby blue mountain are kind of like pops that kind of break the the kind of um break the color palette in a sense and break that and and just have a little spice thrown in there um <laughs> and but that is all about you know those that red and that blue only read as almost like exciting because everything else is in harmony and so those ones stick out so in that sense that background needs to provide that harmony so that when you do a curveball it like is curving against something right it's like sticking out from something that's unexpected um and you know in, in a funny way i often okay i don't know why but i'll tell you this uh sure. like, i think it. about classical music a lot and because i grew up playing classical piano and I was always really like a classicist, so to speak, where I really didn't like once music got to like mid and late romantic and modern and classical, where there was not the same like really rigid structure of what a sonata is or what a, you know, waltz is like whatever. And I love high classical and like even Baroque music that is very structured. And there's a lot of rules about like how these pieces need to be you know, composed. ordered yeah, and composed. And for it's me, that's why, that's why someone like Beethoven, which is like obviously pretty obvious, but is the genius of Beethoven is not just like the melodies or whatever. It's that he would take the structure, he would maintain the expected structure, but he would just bend the rules in places. And that was like the moment of genius. And I think about that a lot with the way that um, I compose my pieces as well, where it's like, you know, when you're listening to a classical piece, you need to listen to the whole beginning part so that three quarters of the way through when something changes, you hear it and you get like, you goosebumps. recognize it. You know what I mean? If you just skip to like the best part of the song, <laughs> you're not gonna know that it's the best part of the song. And that's kind of the same thing that. with like, you need the repetition of the pattern and the background so that the landscape is like, this exciting thing that sticks out from it while still following the same pattern. And so it's not breaking the rules, but it's just pushing them a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I, I think about that a lot and I kind of see how this, I, I just, the, this idea that for me is more obvious in music, I feel like I see in also the way that I make visual work but um and you can see the same idea coming out in this glass piece where mm -hmm. there's two panels on either side that are the same pattern but where the colors are is changed around so that they have quite a different effect um 
And then the middle panel, it's the same recipe kind of as my embroideries where the middle panel shares many of the colors as the pattern panels, but then has some spicy curveballs. So like that blue in the middle is like pops out because it's not expected, you know, it like just contrasts with what you're expecting. Um, no, I, I, I see all that, but I, I you know, I, I think that there's a very interesting, um, I don't want to say dichotomy, but a conversation happening between the embroidered work and, and, and the bead, beaded work. And I mean, just looking at this piece, which I think is a, a big step forward in terms of how you've uh, commissioned, um, am I right in saying it's wrought iron or is it steel? The, the, the framework around it and collaborated with yet another collaborator, an right. artist, artisan, who is basically taking your ideas and you're taking that person's ideas. And it's all coming together to make this larger piece in which your ideas can, I don't know, achieve fruition. I, I, I think it's just this great illustration of the way you work. I think that's just a personality thing where I'm kind of a like, we'll make it work kind of guy. So like that leaves a lot of freedom with my, for my collaborators because I'm open, I'm like excited about whatever they're going to do and I'll make, and, and we'll, we'll, you know, maybe they'll make something that is not what I'm quite expecting, but that will just give me other ideas of what to do with it. It's not that it's like ruins my plan. Do you know what I mean? I was like, there's, I'm really not rigid in terms of, um, in terms of envisioning a piece and then how it turns out. And sometimes it turns out really close to what I envision and other times it turns out different, but I like still love it. And like, you know, it's still my work, you know what I mean? So. Well, without giving it all away, can you tell us how this piece arrived at its final sort of shape? Because I'm, I'm sure there's also a, a conversation happening. That's yeah, kind of so when I, to. So this is the second body of glassworks I made. And the first body of glassworks were only landscapes and they were not on the wall. They were like freestanding structures. Um, and it all kind of goes back to like the, it all kind of goes back to like where I even got this idea, um, which is like, so yeah, these are, this is pictures of the original. Can you also see me on video? Yes, okay. I can. I, can. I think everyone can. I can't see me on video. Okay. Um, so this is the original inspiration for these glass pieces. This is from Hebron, um, from a glass factory there. Um, Hebron has had thousands of years of, of um, glass making. This, this glass making tradition. Um, and even in Roman times, the Romans were like, wow, this glass from Hebron, and they started like, it be became a thing to like bring glass from Hebron. Um, and so, and you know, a lot of the glass that they make is like, I don't have anything right here. Just, you know, cups and little vases and little things like that, like blown glass stuff. But Could while you, I was at yeah, the factory- I was gonna say, did you find this or you, this was there and you- Right, so while I was at the factory, visiting for like another project, I came across this kind of sconce thing that's beaded and I had never seen anything like that. Wow. Um, and so I was like, well, I could make like, you know, the beads in a way act like the stitches on the embroideries, AKA they're just essentially like pixels or whatever. And so I could make a landscape by changing some of the bead colors, right? Um, so I was like, I can, I wanna do this, but like, you know, obviously there were things that I would wanna change. Um, in terms of like, instead of it being a little half or quarter sphere kind of sconce, flatten it out so it becomes like, you know, essentially like a canvas or like a surface you can like paint on, so to speak. Um, but what I did was that was replicate exactly how they make it. So the beads that they make, and then here's like, let me see, I have like a bowl here. So this is like a bead that I made. So it's just like basically looking at their beads and like learning how to make the same thing and then structuring the pieces the same way where like every two inches, there's a vertical beam and then every half inch there's horizontal and then you with little wires like attach all the beads one by one to the scaffolding. Um, and so 
then I have. So how do you attach them? I'm sorry. I mean, it is dumb. dumb Literally dumb. with like a little piece of wire. So there's a little there's a little hole because they're no there's no hole. No, there's the no bead hole. is shaped like this. The bead uh, has a waist essentially. So glad I asked. So you wrap the 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 wire around that and like twist it so it's tight and then stick it through the scaffold. But the bead, the big part of the bead, doesn't go through, and so it sits right there. And then you like attach the wire Got to it. the thing. Um, and so, yeah, and so these first pieces, I kind of came up with shapes that would stand freely. And then a metal worker friend of mine um, fabricated those for me and then would deliver them to me. And then I, in the meantime, would make thousands of beads. <laughs> uh, and then when they're all done, start one by one, like putting the beads where they go, start at the bottom and like build up. Um, and now you 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 cook these beads at home, right? You flame well, not them. at home. I do no. them at this at Brooklyn Glass, which is actually like two blocks from my studio. Um, uh. Because doing the flame work, you need a lot. You need oxygen. You need gas. You need an annealer, which is like basically a kiln, but like for glass. Um, and so it's like a whole lot of. And you also need like proper ventilation, which my studio doesn't have. So it's like it's not the kind of thing you want. I don't want to get into like having to buy like tanks of oxygen. So. Um, I learned how to, and I also, this is during COVID. Originally, I was going to go to Hebron and work with the glass makers and have them make the beads for me, um, was the original idea. Not necessarily would have been better, but that was what I was thinking. And I was actually, I had a ticket to go in March, 2020, and obviously that trip got canceled. Um, and so... I started looking for places in New York that could fabricate the beads for me. And one thing led to another, it was really expensive, blah, blah, blah. And the, the owner of Brooklyn Glass suggested to me like, why don't you just take a lesson here and learn how to, they're easy to make, <laughs> they're hard, hard to make. Um, and so I took a lesson and since then have made them myself. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and, 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 and in the end, I'm so glad that that's how it happened because now I feel like it's a craft that I know. Like it's it, it, it's like it's 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 actually the right thing to do is to have learned how to do it myself and like do it myself. Um, and your and beads also, don't when, look like anybody else's beads. I mean, when I think of beads, I don't think of right the things that you're making, which I right. accept your beads, but you've yeah. you've done something. It's kind of extra. It's but also more. when handling them, if I hadn't made them myself, I feel like I would be so scared to like break it or something. Whereas having made them I know like how robust they are and stuff it's just like being intimate with them I think is really important um this is a picture of like making a bead on the on the flame um and if you if you kind of move forward in the slideshow now it's show I think I gave a bunch of pictures that show like a, the process of making one bead um yeah so this is starts where you take a it's like a rod of glass and you melt it down and this is called like a ball gather where you literally like gather a ball of of like molten glass on the end of the rod and you're just holding the other end with your hand glass is a very poor conductor of heat so you can this side can be 2000 degrees and then four inches away is your hand and it's fine um so you do that and then next slide so once it's like gathered the amount of glass you want so that the bead is like the right size you then, there's this, I, I don't even know what this thing is called. It's like a V. <laughs> and then the next slide shows um, you're, you're rotating the bead this whole time to keep it spherical. You're using gravity to keep it like a circle. Mm -hmm. And then in the next slide, um, you see you, you're, you're rotating it and you sit it down into that V and you cut the like waist into the bead. Um, and, and this whole time the glass is cooling and it's cooling and it's getting harder. And so you kind of keep rolling it in there until it's nice and solid again. Uh, and then next slide, there's your bead on the end of the rod. And then you briefly warm up where you're going to like Cut clip it. off the bead. Cut. And then you just use shears and you clip the bead where you want. And then the next slide will show yeah, so there's the bead. It's it doesn't look like it. It looks totally the right normal color, but actually it's still really hot. 
So everything is done with like tweezers, but then you put it in what's called an annealer. Mm -hmm. And it's, so that's the annealer and it stays in there overnight. Um, and the annealer is set to 960 degrees for soft glass. And over the course of eight hours throughout the night, the temperature is slowly brought down to room temperature because if you do basically because glass doesn't conduct heat well even in this tiny like one inch bead one end of it could be hundreds of degrees hotter than the other end and if you think about the physics of that when something is hot the molecules are vibrating really fast and when something's cooler they're vibrating slower and when it's glass the same piece of glass vibrating at different rates will just make it pop and explode and so when you finish working on something in glass, you put it in the annealer and that brings it all up to the same temperature and then slowly walks it down overnight so that it all cools at the same rate. Um, and is so this like, what are we looking, tell me what we're looking at, George. Is this one day's worth of beads? Yes. So I can a make day. roughly 120 beads a day or something like that on a normal day. Um, so that's why I line them up so I can keep count of like how many I've made. So that's like, this is like 125 or something like that. Um, and these come out that color or they're finished. Yeah, so that's, see, you can see the temperature is 73 degrees. So that's after they've cooled. Um, I love sometimes that green. When, they, when they warm up, they become a different color. And this green is the one in that piece, the three panel piece. This is like, these are the beads that are in that piece. Um, and I always make like an extra 10 beads or something so that there's some wiggle room if any of them break or if any of them are like, slightly too big or too small because you're eyeballing it you're there you're not like weighing how much glass to put in the bead like you're just going with like what looks right um but yeah so that's the bead making process and it's, yeah it's, it's great because it seems like you knew what you wanted and then you just taught yourself the technique about you know yeah i mean it's really it. you know it's it's uh it just takes a lot of planning like i can actually show you like this is my can you see me i can't see um but this is like my little book i take with me to the glass studio that has the plan for the piece and it has the different colors of glass that i've ordered because i order my own glass from the supplier and then as i make the beads i'll write like 105 then plus 80, 185, and like until I get to like, I needed 295 of that one, so I made 305 of it. And like, just you literally have to like go through day by day. One piece will have, this piece has 1200 something beads. Uh, the two panel ones have like 864 beads. So like, it's just like weeks of <laughs> making beads all the time <laughs> before you're ready to put it together. And one um, more glass making for dummies question. Um, does it come in the color that it ends up being? Yeah. So you buy generally, it in that, okay. Generally, yes, but sometimes a color looks quite different from before you work it, which is like misleading, but you know, again, make it work. Um, but generally they return back to like the color they were when they were cooled after you work them. But some of them, like you see in the in the dark green, there are some that are lighter and some that are darker in that little dark green area of the mountains. Mm -hmm. That's because when I when I made those beads, some of them I like ended up getting hotter than others. Like some must have just melted, and others I got a little bit more towards like white hot almost. And so I like in effect burnt them, but they came out lighter because it like messed up the chemistry of them like literally like the elements that are in that glass because the other thing about glass is that it's actually I learned that also pastels act like this but basically you know some pastels are harder than others just the colors and glass is kind of like that where what gives glass its color is just different elements in the glass right mm -hmm. and so some colors of glass are really fickle and if you heat them up too quickly they'll just explode like any reds are like a pain in the butt to work with because you have to heat them up like the flame is like you know it's like a it's like a blowtorch attached to the table and it's hotter closer to the torch and then the further away you know the flame is going out like that and so the further away is like you know it's cooler slightly and so with very sensitive glasses like reds, you literally need to like 
start warming it up out here and slowly get it closer and slowly, slowly, slowly get it to the point where you can start actually melting it. But then like a blue or especially transparent colors are so, you can just stick them like pretty close to the just, face of the flame and they don't explode. Like, so it's really like temperamental and like different glasses have different temperaments. And like, it's really interesting because it's phys it really is like physics. It's like this element of physics enters into it. That's like really, or chemistry, I don't even know. It's like ever, all that. So for people stuff. looking right now at the screen, this piece would have been a particular, sorry, the expression white knuckle, situation because making that many red beads is a yeah it's never fun but you know it's just it just takes the patience you know what I mean it's like because and, and it's really actually a good lesson in patience because if you rush it's going to explode and you're going to have to start heating it up again but if you take your time it'll heat up slowly but it'll heat up and it won't explode and when it explodes you lose like I don't know half an inch to an inch of that rod and it just flies everywhere and so that's like a bee that you you know what I mean it just kind of like messes everything up when you're impatient and it like and it just makes it worse and you get frustrated um but no but it's fun it's it's all part of yeah, as I said it's part of the craft and it's part of the um you know like I feel like I'm familiar with that now so I know when I'm starting a red one I'm like take it slow see what this you know see what this color can handle um and yeah, anyway, it's been really, really fun to learn these processes, basically. I really no, love it. It sounds incredible. Um, I was wondering if we could talk, because um, we've been talking so much about technique and craft and materials. I was wondering if we could um, do a little digging into the landscape motif, because mm -hmm. in your work, the landscape often appears in juxtaposition with, um, well, with a window, but the window isn't open or with a wall. Right. which is a wall and so and I, I i i find it very um you know it's almost like you're not quite spelling out the circumstances of diaspora but but you you are if, you know if you want to take the time um and and sort of unpack the imagery and i'm, I'm kind of i'm curious as to how i mean you don't have to explain how landscape fits in, but maybe in terms of your experience, how you arrived at that as sort of a central um, imagery in in your you know in your overall right. vocabulary, let's say, um, really the one you keep coming back to. Yes, for sure. Essentially, it does go back to Ethel Adnan in terms of like the inspiration of sorts, but it's because it's it's just it's come to mean so much more to me because basically you know there's there's a lot going on there's conceptual things that have to do with you know diaspora and cultural participation and heritage and all this kind of stuff but there's also a very formal side it's colors and shapes right like formal painting concerns and um i think that both sides of that for me developed like simultaneously where I was thinking a lot about Palestine and I was thinking a lot, you know, I am very lucky that I'm able to go to Palestine pretty often, especially before COVID, I was going like three or four times a year. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> you know, I, and it's, and it's kind of, it's, it's one of these funny ironies were like because my family came to America so long ago and because I'm like only half Palestinian I then have access to go to Palestine whereas like more recent refugees or members of the diaspora can't go because they're too close culturally whereas I'm like far enough culturally that I am allowed to go so they that's like a, the system very it's carefully like a twisted irony a little bit but right. the point is I'm able to go I know what it's like there. And while it is beautiful and everything, it is just a place on earth, like a lot of, you know, like many places. And um, so at the same time, I was, you know, even speaking, it's funny because my father, like no matter how many times he's been to Palestine, which he had been many times, he still somehow when he would be in New York, the way he would talk about it would, was in this way that was like, 
such a dream like like utopia of like rolling olive tree hill hills and like shepherds with their goats and like just this magical like you know the table like just fell off my table um the yeah he just talked about it in this way that was so oh my god not the other one did. anyway sorry. um he talked about it in a way that was so fantastical and then i had you know i've i've for many years also um been learning arabic like I studied formal Arabic in, in college and stuff and I'm fully literate, but I never really spoke Palestinian dialect very well. And so for the past few years on and off when I'm not being like too busy or lazy, I take Arabic lessons online, like on Skype, like one-on-one -on -one kind of tutoring to just practice the local Palestinian dialect. And um, one of my tutors over the years was a Palestinian from Argentina who has never been able to go back to Palestine because he grew up in a refugee camp in Lebanon and then like moved to Argentina. And so, and I noticed like people like him and other members of my family um, talk about it in a way where Palestine is this like magical, perfect place that is so, like really utopian is like the best word I can think of. And so, you know, at the same time, so this, this idea of like this, I think about it, I've also referred to this as like inherited nostalgia, meaning my grandparents told my father stories of like the homeland. And then my father as a child, you know, you fill in what you're hearing with like your own imagination. And then I in turn as a child was told story, these same stories by my father, but they were like his imagined versions. But then I in turn imagined from what he was telling me, I pictured it in my head. And so there's these like layers and layers of people's like imaginations that is all mixed up with their like yearning for the homeland and all this kind of stuff. Um, and definite like romanticization of it and like that kind of stuff. And so all of these ideas were going on, plus just on a formal level, especially inspired by Atal Adnan, getting excited about just working with color and like this color and this color, but then this surprise color and like, you know, like those kind of formal concerns. And I really loved how those ideas merged and became like a landscape can have a purple sky and yellow and green and yellow and blue hills. And that makes sense because this is like a fantastical land that doesn't actually exist. This is this imagination land of people's like dreams and, and, and anything in a sense, could be Palestine in their imagination. It's you know invented. I mean? It's in, It's almost invented right. to evoke those emotions. And in other words, it's, it's like a generic landscape, but you could say. Right, oh. like all of them, like I don't, like I never base the landscape off of like a vista that I've seen or something. It's right. really just, you know, it's really just about composing a canvas and like balancing the canvas, like as any painter would be concerned with. Um, and and the reason that I also have, basically in, a, in some ways, landscape for me serves as just a vehicle for doing color work, you know? And that also speaks to just my own personal, like I've never, maybe it's also because I never went to art school and learned art history, but I've never been able to really connect with like pure abstraction and appreciate it. Um, and so, and I think that's also why Ethel Adnan's work really spoke to me, but there's others like Paul Giragassian, who's a Armenian, Palestinian, uh, or Lebanese. He, um, he did the same thing with human figures that Ethel Adnan did with landscapes, which is like, they're, they're almost abstracted and they're minimal but they still somehow are what they are. And for me, as, as I said, someone who has a hard time with pure abstraction, just knowing that it's like supposed to be a landscape, I think in my brain, what that does is kind of disarms me from worrying about like, what am I looking at? And then I can just like appreciate the colors or whatever, because I'm not being like, what is this? You know what I mean? And not on like a literal level, but on like a subconscious level. And so I, you know, the landscapes for me in that way also just kind of are, it's functional. It like serves as a, a vehicle for working with color because, you know, the landscapes themselves aren't like what's beautiful 
particularly it's more the colors and like the pattern that's going on and like that but like without the landscape it would just be shit I don't know there's something that having that vehicle really contributes to the work and then as I said before also allows me to tie in those other things I was talking about about imagining this utopia and this nostalgia for this homeland and like all that kind of stuff well um, let me push back ever so gently because I I, I, you know, I have a vivid imagination. I am susceptible to the power of suggestion. So knowing what I now know, I look at this image uh, and I sense melancholy. I, I derive a sense of, of longing. This is not a picture of, of, of unadulterated beauty, let's say, even right. though it's quite beautiful. I think that the, the way you've structured the pictures, the landscape is always a relatively smaller part of the picture. It's sort of almost crowded out by these other elements and the other elements seem to prevent the landscape from flourishing. I don't, you know, I, I, could, I could keep going with this, but, you know, uh, so when you say the landscape is primarily a tool for working with color, I would sort of say, well, but then the results of the color and the landscape and the, and the, and the format, the motif are such as to stir up feelings of melancholy right. um, in your viewer. Um, is that just because we're all- well, See, this is where, and it might be a little new agey for, for, for people, but this is where I feel <laughs> like, because as Etel Adnan taught me, work from those insecurities and those, painful parts or issues you have or like things in your life I think that that is why they're like you feeling those emotional things is not I'm not consciously like trying to make a work that makes you feel like melancholy but the work is coming from that place of you know of those difficulties for me and the insecurities and like all that kind of stuff which I think gives it like power to communicate those things, like it, those human emotions, which for me is like what I want artwork to be about. You know, like I look for in art and I want to make art that's like that, where it's not, you know, it can be about something in a general way, but the true, for me, the like, the aim for our work is to just connect and share in, the human experience like with each other right it's not about a diatribe about a specific incident and like my works are political in a sense that they're about palestine for me but like it's not in your fit you know there's not political slogans it's not like about any specific incident or any historical thing even it's just this sharing of humanity is like what I'm going for. Um, and yeah, as I said, like, I don't mean to make something that feels melancholy, but I think that, and I hope that it like stirs up a variety of emotions because a variety of emotions like go into them in a sense. Well, I mean, um, hopefully in the United States, we've become a little bit more accustomed, for example, I mean, it's a clumsy comparison, but to looking at landscape uh, by artists to Native American and- right you know there's a there's a level on which the experience of 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 landscape as depicted by people who are displaced from their land you know it just conveys right. a right. feeling i'm just going to say a feeling an emotion um, where there's you know it's tangled up there's loss there's there's yearning you know there there are a lot of feelings um in the subject of landscape if you happen to be of a people who are themselves dispossessed. Right. Their stature, status is, is that they are dispossessed. I mean, as I said, there's a lot because some of them, I, especially the one in the, the, the glass one in the middle there, I feel like is more abstract. And this actually, this is a good slide to go to. This body of work was from a show in also 2020 um, that, so for this show, and this is, going back again to kind of the classical music structure thing where I kind of, for each body of work and each exhibition, I'll kind of imagine something and it gives me the constraints of like that body of work. And for this body of work, I made all vertical pieces like this. 
of different size, but they all were roughly the same proportion. So they were all these like skinny, tall canvases. And mm -hmm. that is really not natural for landscape. Like it's a reason <laughs> why we call horizontal pieces landscape mode versus <laughs> portrait mode, right? Um, and what I wanted to do with that, what was interesting about that for me was how taking a slice of landscape like this really abstracts it and it's almost not recognizable as a landscape, so to speak, but then it's also like a challenge of how to like draw a landscape out of that. All of the pieces in the show had like a top, they had sky and like the tops of mountains. So that might be the clue that it's like landscape. But this one, for example, you know, the vision for this one was like a red diamond with like pale colors around it that kind of sink back. And then the red is like the focus. And so while this is like a stack of mountains, the different ways, you know, giving that red color such like deep reds and then the pale, pale blues and greens and the pale yellows also play with like the depth and like all this kind of stuff. And it's just, so this was a very formal in a sense, exercise an experiment in like, what the effect would be of doing landscapes in really tall vertical slices. Um, and um, and yeah, and just like allowing it to go that get into an abstract zone where um, I mean, if you go back to the the one with like multiple multiple uh, panels, yeah. So like the the smaller one all the way to the left, mm -hmm. the vision was to have it be like these two diamonds, but then actually like there's all these hills around it. And so closer up, it just looks like hills, but then like further out, you just see like this pastel background with these like two stronger. And then the, the, the next one is like this braid, so to speak, where each mountain, it's like, you can, I mean, in my head, it's, make sense but like basically there's like a warm so the red one on the bottom right corner and then there's a blue and a blue which are cool and then a red and a red and then a blue and a blue and like the reds can be oranges or yellows the blues can be greens also but like cold, cool versus hot like a braid of those um and then the one on the all the way to the right is my favorite i, I think of it as like a clown like a clown costume or something it's like because it's like this checkerboard but like all of the mount but they're made of mountains like there are kind of mountain peaks the whole way but just these exp just you know visual experiments and still touching on all the same concepts but also doing different things visually um and because i mean also a harlequin that is the right word um because right. you know i don't know at Et tell's work i think it's very evident, like some of the pieces are clearly landscapes and others are like, like she has some pieces that I love that are just like three relatively straight lines, like just one color, one color. Horizontal one color. lines, right. They're just bands of color, but just because you know it's her, you know it's a landscape, even though anyone else could do it and it would just be stripes. Do you know what I mean? And that to me is like very, very interesting. And also Paul Gyrgosian, who I feel like is much lesser known, he did exactly the same thing as a Talbo with figures where he has some paintings and drawings that are like huddled groups of people and mm -hmm. then others that just become vertical like strips of paint. And uh -huh. so it becomes just about the color work in the end, but knowing that he's starting with human figures then when he has a really, really abstract one, you still see it. And like, I love that. Like that knowing the artist, you know what it is, even if it doesn't look like what it is. And like that whole thing. So this show is very much like, um, actually, I'll just, yeah, there, someone just put the, yeah, Paul Gergossian. The link to him. His color palette is very 70s, I will say that. But other than that, <laughs> I love. Um, I, I, my, in my crystal ball, Jordan, I foresee you going through a seventies phase. I'm just yeah, going to lay I mean, that out there. This is already good. But... <laughs> hey, you know, I could, I could keep on just one-on-one. -on -one. It's just such a pleasure talking to you, but as we've been talking, um, some questions are coming in. I think we've got some, some good ones. Um, and so I was wondering if Eleanor wanted to come back on and sort of take over and, um, kind of relay some of the best, best of those questions to you or ask the, ask the questioners themselves. I'm ready. 
For sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jordan. And thank you, Dan. This has been really an incredible afternoon. Um, we do have a bunch of questions from the audience. Um, our first question is coming from Laura Lubin. Um, Laura, you can turn on your video if you're comfortable and feel free to unmute and ask your question. You should be able to unmute now, or I can ask it on your behalf. No, that, that's fine. Um, I had a question about the uh, title, The Divorce of the Doves, and I was wondering where this comes from. And I noticed as you were going through the various paintings that quite a few of them are in the same type of vein. They seem to have a literary or historical reference. Could you speak to that? Absolutely. Um, so I mentioned like cultural heritage before, and that's partially, you know, the crafts that I choose are things that I consider a part of my cultural heritage. Um, and um, as an Arab American, one thing that was very sacred in our family was Khalil Gibran, for example, because he mm. was Lebanese, but he was American, Lebanese, and like, you know, he lived right here. Actually, my grandmother lived in the same neighborhood as him, um, which was Little Syria, which is like kind of Tribeca area. Um, and so all, almost all, I mean, actually all my titles of my shows, of my individual works, always come from Arabic literature, songs, like any, so, so in that sense, also literature. Um, and very often it's Ezhal Adnan because her writing is just amazing, but also Khalil Gibran, also Mahmoud Darwish, also uh, lyrics like Um Kulthum. Like usually Um Kulthum is like, like, I don't know if I would use like an Arabic pop star now's lyrics, but like Um Kulthum is like heritage, is like historical, cultural heritage, you know? Um, so yes, and that Divorce of the Dubs is from uh, Khalil Gibran, uh, his book that's like Tears, what is it called? I can't remember. It's like tears and a smile or something like that. Um, and yeah, but I, I kind of, and you know, what I'll do for a body of work or an exhibition is read lots of poetry and, and be looking for certain themes. Um, like, and so for this show, for the James Cohan show, everything has to do with either like boundaries or like parts or, uh, you know, like separation, like divorce, the doves, or like one of them is called like between the butterflies, just like this idea that like something between, cause you know, the separate panels all coming together in the glass work and in the embroidery works. So I was just like going for kind of some of that imagery. Um, a tear and a smile, that's the one, yes, is the name of the, the book that uh, some of these titles come from, the Kool Jabon book. Um, and others of the titles come from Atal Adnan. I have like, I, cause when I read these poetry and stuff, I, I have like a an ongoing list in my phone of just like little phrases, like not even necessarily a full sentence from a, a piece of writing, but just like a couple of words that I like the sound of that I just put on my list of like future titles for stuff. Cause they're, you know, and it's again, it's playing into this, like it's all part of this culture, cultural heritage. So. Awesome, yeah. thank you. Um, thank you for that great question. Um, our next question is going to be from GE. Um, GE, you should be able to unmute now. Thank you so much, Eleanor and, and, and Dan and Jordan. And, and all the repetitions that go into making these textile works and the glass bead works, are you making not only meditations, obviously on deep histories here, but also about renewal itself? Well, you know, I will say that is something that, especially with embroidery, I was actually like, not scared of, but like, okay. So when I started, <laughs> when I started doing it, that's fine. Cause I'm just like doing, it. but then when I started working with the women, um, at first they were really kind of 
they were almost like embarrassed because I'm a boy doing this and that like never happens Palestine but once they like saw some of my work like the first time I met them I brought something I was working on and they were able to like inspect my stitches and stuff and they were like oh okay like it's they were like it must be your you're cool your Palestinian blood so you're like past, yeah so then they kind of like accepted me and over the years of working together um more and more they start asking like they want me to design dresses for them to make for themselves or they want to design like they want me to design stuff because for them like the colors I choose and stuff they're like wow we love that like we you know I wouldn't have thought of that or like whatever and so over the years I've definitely felt included and also kind of a part of their community like they I'm I'm a Palestinian embroiderer too and that's fine because it's daunting it's like I don't want to like I'm doing it as you said in a way that is like looking at the history of it so I don't want to like change how it's done I want to like observe how it's done and respect how it's done and then just do my own thing as like my artwork as a New York based person um and I, so the idea of like me influencing what is done in Palestinian embroidery is scary. However, I've gotten over it a little bit uh, over the years where I feel more included and respected. Like it's just a, 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 a new way of doing Palestinian embroidery. And like, it's not, I mean, it's funny because um, the women that I work with they look at the landscapes that I do and they kind of don't understand how I do it, which I think is really funny, but I think it actually also speaks to their understanding of, of the embroidery and, and how it works versus mine. Whereas I'm seeing it as like pixels in a very like post internet way. And they're seeing it as like flowers, like this is a flower, that's flower. So like interrupting that for them is really <laughs> unnatural. And they, they would like, that even sometimes when they do like a because usually I'll I'll have them leave me like a, a square or rectangular empty space right um they'll even mess that up and accidentally finish a couple of the flowers that were supposed to get cut off because it's just how they relate to the patterns and it's different than mine because they're relating to them in the traditional way and I'm relating to them as an outsider just like learning how to do it myself right and I think that's I think that's cool to embrace that um but yeah I I I I mean, I hope I answered your question, but I definitely have thought about that. And like, um, you know, as I said, now I appreciate when they're like, they want me to pick <laughs> some colors for them or something. I think that that's really cool. But so you're definitely linked in then back into the oh, yeah. need of the thing. And that's wonderful to see and hear and understand. Thank you. Thank you for that question, GE. Um, our next question is from Lana Herzog. Alana, um, if you want to turn on your video, if you're comfortable and ask a question. Hi, <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my connection's not great. Um, so I, I mean, I guess what I wrote is pretty, you know, pretty clear, but I just wanted to think about um, some of the differences between the previous work that I've seen of yours and this current body. Um, I really love them both. Um, in, the, in the earlier work, one of the things I liked a lot is the way that the, um, your embroidery kind of infiltrates the other image and merges with it. And it's like this kind of almost, uh, it takes a while to process, I think is what I would call it, you know, like to figure out what that disruption is. And um, it almost resembles, I always thought at first, it, it resembled the kind of old fashioned uh, test for color blindness, you know, where you had to right. see, see whether you had the red and the green, right? Um, and I like that kind of monolithic or unified image. And this next body of work kind of refers to me to a more ordered, more rational way of presenting imagery. Um, and so the disruption is definitely there, but it, it reads really differently. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, how you feel about that difference and if you're embracing a kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of a different language, a different um, references to other kinds of artwork, you know, 
um, different kinds of conceptual strategies, right. how you see um, I will start by saying that these panel pieces actually arose from like a logistical, <laughs> um, a, 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 like essentially the fabric I work on, I buy in Palestine, right? And it only comes in one size, right? The roll is 66 inches like wide and goes on for meters and meters and meters, but like can only be so wide. So in my show at James Cohan last time, so like in 2020, that's why those, the big pieces were, they were still only like 50 inches tall or so, maybe a little less, um, but went on quite long. Cause I was, that's, that is the way that I can grow not both directions at the same time you either so the show the ones that were in LA in 2020 the vertical ones were the same thing they were tall but not wide because it's like you have to choose one or the other because the fabric is only so wide and so for years I was like how do I do bigger and I was one of the ways was doing separate panels that come together as one piece and um, obviously I could have tried to like sew the fabric together into a bigger piece and then do it or something. But I, in the end felt that, you know, the same way that like, because I, I think it works for me because so much of the focus is on the craft and on the materials that I like to embrace the materials for what they are. And so like, for example, the metal work and the glass work, uh, there's no like finishing done. It's like, you can see the welds, you can see the like difference because it's like, that's what it is. And I love that that's what it is. And so in the same way with the panels, I was like, instead of trying to hide that there's separate panels and like go right up into the edge, just like work with the panels. And then I was like, oh, the panels can be all different patterns themselves where it could be like square, rectangle, square, rectangle. And that becomes another pattern on top of the literal embroidery patterns and everything. So I just, you know, decided to see it as like an extra element to play with um, in the goal of just growing in scale. And so that's really where these pieces came from. Um, and, you know, we're the first, you know, it was kind of like uh, with a lot of this stuff, you got to try it and see how it comes out and how you like it and like whatever. So like, they're definitely were like the first go, just like, I mean, I feel like the glass pieces I did the last show, versus the glass pieces this show so much has changed and developed within that and I could imagine who knows what's going to change in these paneled pieces as I continue um making them but um and so so the the differences that you mentioned are for sure I agree like and I love the the effect of how I usually have done the collaborative pieces where it just interrupts the pattern and the same flower like that's cut off will continue but suddenly it's like a different color and it's part of a landscape and whatever and that kind of disruption where it's kind of this visual thing because the pattern is fully completed evenly yet there's this break visually and like um and I've always been really excited about that um but these obviously as you mentioned have a different effect going on where they don't have that stark break um but they have other things going on so <laughs> Um, think, makes me think of the Mexican um, clothing, and I, I'm not going to try to butcher the name. It's simple, but where basically the everything is woven on a backstrap loom, and it has a, the same dimension, and so you get these long bands of fabric, right. and then they are differently, and very modular. And actually, and I also what I love about these these. Uh, these panel pieces is that it actually reminds me of the Palestinian dresses where, uh, you know, where this embroidery originates from, because when making a dress, you're going to make one panel that becomes an arm later, and then another one that becomes an arm later, and then another one that becomes the chest later. And so like, before you assemble it into the dress, you have basically what I have in the show, which is just these separate panels. But instead of maybe instead of sewing it together into a dress, you stretch them on canvases and they become like one composition as a painting, you know? Um, but yeah, anyway, thank you. <laughs> awesome. Um, thank you so much for that question. 
um, I'll pass over the mic now to Nick um, for our second to last question. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Jordan and Dan, for this wonderful conversation. And I second the links in the chats. I encourage everyone to go see the works. Um, I have two questions, Jordan. They may or may not be related. Um, the first kind of simply is if you um, relate to uh, Persian sacred geometry at all in a particular way. Um, I'm also curious, you know, how bookmaking and zine making, you, you kind of briefly mentioned it, but how that is connected to your work, if that's um, sort of, if that's a part of it or if it's sort of a supplement and, and um, yeah. Well, interestingly, for some reason we didn't put any in the slideshow. I don't know what we were thinking, but in, so in my show in LA that was just in February, uh, I did, I showed five pieces that were um, woodworked, like inlaid brass and mother of pearl in wood that I like also learned how to do and like did all the inlay myself and everything. Um, but those were actually specifically inspired by Monir from on for Mayan and like some pieces of hers, um, specifically, a piece called Third Family, which is a suite of, I think, nine pieces, I want to say, could be 10, that are, um, it's like triangle, square, pentagram, oh no, pentagon, sorry, pentagon, hexagon, heptagon, like, etc. Uh, and so I did the same, I did like three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, three, four, five, six, seven sided wood pieces um, that were, you know, very similar to the scale of Monir's, a little smaller, but also um, hung the way that her, that, that body of work was hung. And, uh, and that's, you know, in the embroidery, there's geometry, but it's not the same. Like in Palestinian embroidery, there are certain geometries that are traditional, but it's not your classic like Islamic geometry situation. It's not like calligraphy and stuff. Um, but the woodworking was the first time for me where it was like, that really came out where it was like, uh, I had to decide on shapes and like for the bases of them. And then um, it just led me right there where it was like, okay, triangle, then square, then, you know what I mean? Like it just kind of became part of that. Um, and I really love that about them. And like, now I'm starting to work on further um, wood inlay pieces. And it, this is already the first thing is like, okay, what shapes do we want to continue with that suite? Or do we want to like get more creative? I don't know, like there's a lot of directions to go, but that geometry is, a, is like central to those wood pieces. So I'm, um, I think I'm going to get a lot further into it than I have been up until now. And then wait, what was your other question? Oh, the zines. Okay. Yeah. Zines are, so my day job before I um, have just been an artist now for a few years was I was the um, like co-director of the Printed Matters New York and LA Art Book Fairs. And so I spent like my first four years back in America working at Printed Matter and had, you know, I'd, I'd seen some zines in my day, but like was not that into it necessarily, but of course being at Princeton Matter and learning that like insane history of everything and just being exposed to like all these amazing self-published like artist books. Um, and also part of the community of it as well, where like, as I was doing the fairs, I started to want to like have things to trade with people because everyone would just trade zines they make and stuff. And so I started making zines because then I could like trade my zines for like other people's like whatever it's just about that community and about essentially you know it still is in a in a purest sense like about it's not about money it's not about making it's just about like sharing ideas and visuals with people who are interested in that like so and that's still kind of loosely my zine policy where it's like if someone wants the zine they can have the zine because not everyone cares about the zine, you know? So if you're interested in it, then like, I want you to have it, you know? Um, but so to date, I have made a zine for every exhibition, every solo presentation or exhibition. Um, oh. And 
I knew that I was going to have to get up for some reason, but I have a pile of them right out in the other room. I'll grab one second. Uh, where are these? You knew to ask that question, Nick. <laughs> I'm glad I did. I can, while, while Jordan's in the other room, I will just say that um, the specific woodworks he was talking about um, are, you can see those works in this link at Epti. Okay, sorry, I have them. I have a few. And that Ebgi? And that Ebgi? Sorry Ebb if I'm saying that wrong. Ebgi. Good. Um, so I have not yet released the zine for the show that's up at James Cohan, but we're gonna do a zine launch at some point during the show. Um, but here, I can give you an example. So sometimes I make really like, just on my copy machine here, like old school zines that are really um, classic, just black and white Xerox DIY. Others, I've had a friend who has a Resograph press. And so I've made a few zines on with him that he's published for me. Um, one example is for the show, Adonat Ebgi, those vertical pieces. I made this scene. Um, it's called We Are the Ones to Go to the Mountain, which is the name of the show. And each page has a title of one of the artworks, which is from uh, an Etzel Adnan. All the titles come from the same Etzel Adnan poem. Um, they're all, and then like they kind of become another, they're just like words I pulled out of an Etzel Adnan book and then rearranged into like their own poem again, like a new poem or something. But, and it's all the titles of the pieces, but basically on a visual side, so like as you go through the zine, the pages are cut. And so as you like continue through the zine, this landscape forms, I'm just gonna like skip ahead. Um, this landscape forms that's like similar to the compositions in the show essentially, right? Like these vertical stacks. Um, so that's one zine, for example. Um, I made, this scene from my last show at James Cohan, which is I cut the sky in two, and that this all about like do du like duality in a sense, and like um, the the zine is all like there's like two there's two spines instead of one there's two colors and like the actual whole zine is <laughs> is a never ending zine meaning. Um, you have a cover and it has, the back cover has an Arabic version. And then as you flip through the zine, it's all these kind of risograph compositions of just landscapes and like patterns, just like a fun, you know, like a visual, uh, just, it's a very like risograph thing. Like it's, it's utilizing risograph in like a, in a, in a dorky way. And then in the middle, there's like a second, cover and back cover that's the Hebrew version and then you can just like keep going and then eventually you'll like hit the Arabic cover again and you can just keep going oh, that's page is supposed to be glued um yeah and like the compositions like essentially like the works in the James Cohan show like uh change color here but continue the same mountain slope and whatever so it's like this abrupt thing anyway so that's another thing and then uh, I love this one I just made for the for the show that was up in LA last month because um, that show had woodworking and also had the frames I did wood inlay I did inlay on the frames of the embroideries too to like tie it all together and so for that zine I made these like little these are like wood veneer paper like all different colors of types of wood and then they have this like Japanese um, like lace paper layer and then a colored paper layer. And then the whole thing is just these compositions like this that are made just on a photocopier with, I like do collages of construction paper where I'm like ripping up the construction paper to make these like mountains that have these nice, like kind of organic feeling edges. And just, so these are just like experiments in composition essentially, but um, the zine itself just like, has the sensibility of the show in a sense. So like a lot of them are just about that. And they and they're not, I I I wouldn't really refer to them as supplemental rather than like basically 
when I make a zine for an, for an exhibition, I try to address the same concepts that are going on in the embroideries from a different approach, different visuals, different language, right, in the zine. But hopefully the idea is that like between seeing the show and seeing the zine, you can like, it's like more breadcrumbs to figure out like what I'm getting at. Um, and that's the whole idea. So the zines themselves are like artworks and they're, um, they're additioned, but like not necessarily permanently. Like I'll just make usually like between 20 and 50 for the show, but then like could republish them more later. Like, um, which I think is cool because they're not, I mean, as much as some of them are more expensive to make than others, like the wood one was like pricey, but at the end of the day, it's not about that. So I want them to be accessible. And like, this is another one. This was for the ADAA show that I did with James Cohan right before, um, right before COVID. And in classic, why is like, I never have the thing like that I want right here. This is the cover of an Etal Adnan book called Night, but I just like chopped and screwed it. And it's like my cover now. Um, and it's also Rizograph. And that, that exhibition was all black, um, black canvases with embroidery on them. And it was like all about this dress that I have from Palestine that is black with all this blue and red and orange embroidery on it. And so these are just these compositions of Rizograph across like different textures. Um, so it's literally just like a, and like some of it is like Arabic. This is like a, what song is this? Oh, this is like a Shadian song. Cause the, the thing is called Night. And so this is a song called like, oh yeah, like whatever, it's about night. Um, and then, you know, some like Islamic, like mosque ceiling <laughs> photograph. And I actually snuck in a, um, where is it? Oh, this is very like Orientalism, a little desert sand as a texture. Um, and where does the one I put, there's a Monir here. This is like a detailed shot of a Monir from on for my glass piece. That's like the texture oh. that's like laid across the landscape colors. Um, anyway, so like, and this very much like feels like the vibe of those pieces and that. So um, yeah, so I love making zines. And a lot of the time they're really, you know, the works they make, whether glass or wood or embroidery, are really time consuming and are really planned out. So it's really fun to make a zine that's like quick and dirty and like just done. And like, it's, it just, it just feels like a break from like these long-term <laughs> pieces that take months to make one, you know? So um, yeah, I love making zines and keep an eye out for the event at James Cohan um, where I'm gonna launch the zine for that show which is gonna be, um, it's actually gonna be like a poster zine kind of. <laughs> so I think people will like that because people like posters. Um, but yeah, that's my zine story. Thank you for loving zines. And I can't help but notice and, and the one you showed us that it's so reminiscent of the Jordan Belson collage, the works that are on Google oh, right. right now. Um, we just happened to talk, be talking about that this past week, but um, I, I love when those connections happen. So thank you, Jordan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nick, for that question. Thank you, Jordan. Um, I'm going to ask our final question um, on behalf of an audience member. Um, are you interested in critiquing how the art establishment prioritizes certain media and formats over others? Um, perhaps replacing the paradigm of oil paintings and bronze structures with one in which glass embroidery and other traditional media are equally validated? Um, this is uh, interesting because I like, okay, so I was in the show at the Whitney um, that was like this art in like craft in art show that was basically like a look at their collection. And like, it was an amazing show that had like tons of, it went back to like Annie Albers and Rauschenberg and Sheila Hicks all the way to contemporary. 
And it was just looking at people who use craft materials in their work, um, which, you know, raised this question for sure. And we did like a press junket one day and there was this, this conversation and they referred to the word craft is like the C word. And I really thought that was funny because I know that like in the history, <laughs> in the history, especially when it comes to like, especially like 70s, 80s, 90s, like feminism discussion, like that is a, a, a real thing, right? Like that work is like not taken as seriously, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not like discrediting that, but in in my experience, I've always thought of the word craft as like, master of your craft right like something to be proud of like even a painter would be described as a master of their craft if they're like really good at the technique of painting right and that's how I always like have thought about craft and for me like because really it's like learning how to do it is only the first step you have to get good enough at it to then be able to manipulate it how you want to make like your artwork out of it. So it really is about like becoming very skilled at this technique. Um, and it definitely even irked me. See, here's the thing. In the Whitney show, there were some pieces that were utilizing craft materials, which was their, you know, their that was their requirement, so to speak. That's what they were looking for. But it bothered me when the people would like use craft materials, but not actually do the technique that you're supposed to do with them. So like gluing down beads instead of beading them on thread. Like that to me is a big difference. And to me, like, I'm not, I'm, I'm, something can be awesome if it's not done the right way or whatever, but like, it's extra awesome when it's done the real way. And it requires that technique and skill as well as the idea and the visual and everything that goes along with it. Because, um, yeah, so anyway, the point is to answer the question, uh, I don't know about like replacing, but one thing for me, you know, I've always been, I feel like pretty pragmatic about like the reality of like the world we live in, capitalism, commercialism, whatever. And it's like art in a sense is, I mean, art is a lot of things, but it is also an industry, right? And so, um, but not only an industry, but it's like a, it's kind of a set thing, right? Like, like uh, obviously there have been movements of people questioning what art is and there's all the ready mades and there's all the like crazy installations of like whatever. But at the end of the day, I, in my mind, I, you know, because I was starting with embroidery, which was a medium that was like originating on clothing or whatever, um, I was like, okay, I want to engage with like visual art, like capital A. So I'm going to like stretch it on a canvas and put it in a frame so that it is like seen as art immediately, right? I don't want to, I'm not interested personally in questioning what is art, what can art be? I see it as like art is an existing industry and I want, I'm choosing to engage in that industry. So like I'm making art objects, right? And art objects more often than not are like on the wall and they are framed and they are like ready to like have in your museum or your house or like whatever. And that's just the reality of it. And for me, it's like, it hasn't ever conflicted with like what I wanted to make. Like it looks, I'm making what I want to make and it looks great in a frame. So like everyone's happy. Um, but so in that sense, I think it's more like adding, it's not about, for me, it's not about like challenging all these existing things, but more just like, okay, I'm going to engage with this and, you know, kind of get away with not painting on a canvas, but still calling it a painting. But like, and so, and, and, and in a way, you know, it's funny, but like, I feel like there's a wave of the craft movement, especially like Sheila Hicks and like, um, like that era where it was not just using craft, but it was also about the fact that it was craft. And it was like, about the materials right so it was like we are making fiber work and it's about like what fiber is like and it's about exploring fiber for the sake of exploring fiber whereas i've always tried to like be like okay yeah it's embroidery but that's not the like concept right like that's not what i'm discussing in the work is not embroidery and fiber it's i'm using embroidery as the medium, but like 
in a sense, treating it like painting, where it's like paint, like there are painters, it's a good example. There are painters who make paintings that are like about painting, right? And about the history of painting and about you know, technical things. And then there's lots of painters who just make paintings about whatever they wanna make work about that just happens to use painting. And so I'm, a I'm not all the way there because obviously embroidery does enter into it in terms of the cultural thing, but in, a, in other ways I am where I'm like, I'm, I'm making work about you know, nostalgia and diaspora and homeland and whatever, like all these things that you could make in a lot of media and I choose to make it with embroidery. So like, and in that sense, I feel like it is elevating or being more respectful of these media as media that you can use to make artwork in because it's not just all about the fact that I'm doing embroidery. It's not embroidery about embroidery, right? It's like using embroidery just as a painter would use paint. So that's, I hope I answered the question. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dan, again. Thank you, Jordan. Um, and we do have a tradition here at the rail of closing our community events with a poetry reading. Um, so I am thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, uh, Elizabeth Robinson the stage. Um, Elizabeth Robinson's most recent project is Rumor from Parlor Press. A new book, Being Modernists Together, is forthcoming in 2022 from Solid Objects. Recent work has appeared in or is forthcoming from Big Other, um, Conventions, Denver Quarterly, Fence, Image, New Letters, Plume, Closet, and Salt. Elizabeth, thank you for joining us. Um, I'll pass the mic to you to close us off. Close us out. Right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read some poems from Being Modernists Together, which um, comes from Robert McAlman and Kay Boyle's modernist memoir called Being Geniuses Together. And uh, what I found is that I really, really kept falling in love with these modernist figures and the dead are very avail available. So um, I would have these relationships with them and sometimes pair them um, with each other, whether they knew each other or not. And then um, in order to kind of open up the poems, I would put these little um, biographical blurbs of lesser known facts about them between the poems. And I just want to pause and say, thank you, Jordan. That was so enjoyable. Um, thank you. The work is really delightful, but also your way of thinking through it. So the first poem that I want to read is about Lee Miller, who's best known as a um, World War II photographer. And she, she had um, been a model and then became a photographer and persuaded Vogue to let her go over over towards the war and become a war photographer. And you may be familiar with her because of a photo of a dead German soldier, but also uh, a famous photo of her taking a bath in Hitler's bathtub uh, at the end of the war. Left with a family friend when she was seven years old, Lee Miller was raped and infected with gonorrhea. As a teenager, Miller's father, an amateur photographer, took many nude photos of her. She later became an exceptionally successful fashion model, though her career came to an abrupt end when a photograph um, by Edward Steichen was used in a Kotex ad without her consent. Jean Cocteau coated her body in butter and made her into a plaster cast for blood of a spirit. No one knows who Lee Miller is. At an early age, I broke open my very self and let no one tell you that it was otherwise. A violation subverts itself, becomes a camera. I was never, not ever, afraid of controlling the light. Slightly before dawn, the light bounced off my flesh. This curious source preceded and provoked the day that was to come but which had not yet shed anticipation of the sun. 
Wrongly, the eye considers itself a lens, and wrongly, sight is thought to redound to its organ. The body, I can give evidence, is an instrument of sensitivity that absorbs its own records. At an early age, I saw all that I need see, and yet the eye flushes itself out, not with tears, nor with its evidentiary, but with a form of trust that goads it forward to the next excess. Born Maria de los Remedios Alicia Rodriga Varro y Uranga, Remedios Varro was born in Spain but fled to Mexico during World War II. Varro was one of a group who invented the surrealist game Exquisite Corpse. When Benjamin Pere came to Barcelona to support the anti-Franco faction of the Spanish Civil War, Varros and Pere fell in love and married. Only after her death was it discovered that she had never divorced her first husband. Varro lived in the same neighborhood of Mexico City as Leonera Carrington, and the two were great friends. They attended meetings led by the Russian mystic Gurdjieff, making up recipes, surrealist recipes, and writing collaborative magic spells, sending prank letters to neighbors. Varro died in 1963, 48 years before the death of Leonora Carrington. Born in England, Leonora Carrington rebelled against her affluent family and was attracted to surrealist art even by the age of 19. After studying painting in London, she went to Paris where she met and fell in love with Max Ernst. After Ernst was arrested multiple, multiple times by the Vichy government, he fled to the United States with the help of Peggy Guggenheim. Carrington suffered a psychotic break and was hospitalized in Spain, after which she moved to Mexico. The Mexican government commissioned her to paint a mural for the National Museum of Anthropology, entitled El Mundo Mágico de los Mayas. It is now Tuxla. Remedios Varro, for once, outlives Leonora Carrington. I always pause before making confessions to you. We were children, not together, but certainly simultaneously, and now, how much later? I drink cherry, Mexican cherry wine in your sublime absence. Peculiar revisionary recipe becomes visionary recipe. At the time we were girls, I'd begun life as a boy. There was a brighted, brightly painted Caribbean door between us, that is, between versions of who I was and would be. At your instigation, I opened my mother and opened that bright door, my vagina, to find it filled with lather, a blue essence or creature, overflow. From that day forward, we played continuously as girls in the park, but a continent away from each other, boy and girl, girl and girl, recipe and recipe, tarantulas, axolotls, plumed serpents. It was all purple if it wasn't blue, an incursion one makes from oneself into the other, but not really, as if. Nopales, whippies, regalos, and other such souvenirs of the loss of the homeland, by which you understand perfectly. I mean the loss of one's birth to body. Before I died, and for the purposes of this narrative, that occurred 73 years, a prime number, after your demise. I had an urge to bathe, setting a shower above my face, I rinsed it all away. Beneath me, so suds rose prettily from the drain. More blue essence, possible perversion. This time I bent down and took it in through my mouth, glowing foam. To eat is always visionary recipe. Meanwhile, the suds also covered my feet in silky slippers. 
how they clung. I was never prime you. As ardent about living as I was about magic. Compromises are necessary. In the summer heat, creatures mistake my table for a door and they come to it. My practice is to open. Nostril, eyelid, lung, thigh, appendix, armpit. Blue inconsistency. This is what I advise. Sitting here, tableside, I salute your longevity. It's true friendship. And remove my periwinkle slippers so that my feet are for more, forevermore released to the cool floor. Their blue lips opening on one another. Dorothy Day, a founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, was involved in virtually every social justice movement of the 20th century, from suffragism to pacifism to civil rights and farm workers' rights. She credited her early friendship with the playwright Eugene O'Neill to intensifying the religious sense that was in me. In 1929, she lived briefly in Hollywood writing film dialogue. When the stock market crashed, she returned to New York where her life in the Catholic worker movement took shape. She is now under consideration for canonization in the Catholic Church. Anna Mae Wong was born and grew up in downtown Los Angeles. She determined early that she would be an actress when, as a child, she watched movies being filmed in the streets of her neighborhood. Frustrated with the limits on roles offered to her as a Chinese American in the United States, she lived for a time in Europe where she was friends with Lani Riefenstahl and acted in a play with Laurence Olivier. Wong's greatest professional disappointment arose when the part of Olan in the 1937 film The Good Earth went not to her, but to the German actress Louise Reiner. Reiner won an Academy Award for her appearance. Dorothy Day muses over dinner with Anna Mae Wong. It's strange that we should find ourselves together, except that we are both devotees of beauty and able to find it in places that many people disdain to look. I found a painting once in a building destined for demolition, and it was so ugly that it actually emitted a smell. But survival, as you know, is against all odds a beautiful thing. On Gold Mountain, many people shine with wealth, so when I hung my painting at its base, they recoiled and returned to its peak where they stayed far from me. I like to think that a good cup of tea with one's own private ugliness is comfort not just to me, but to misbegotten beauty of all stripes. Your loveliness, I realize, is such that no one could mistake it, and yet some do. It almost makes me wish that my abrasiveness could be worked out as painting, that like the beetle accidentally crushed underfoot, I could give off a smell so pungent that it stained what was beneath it, and we thought it gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was really lovely. Um, thank you again to Jordan and Dan. Um, thank you also to Audrey, Sarah, and the extended team at James Cohan for making today's event possible. And we always encourage everyone to view our art of these conversations on our YouTube channel where we will be uploading today's conversation shortly. And if you can, join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a reading for Gregory Corso, Corso featuring poetry read by Brenda Kultas, Kyle De, De Kiannon, Tanaya Nasser Frederick, Simon Pichet, and Rachel Rame. And you can now turn on your microphones to say hello and goodbye as you leave. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank, you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Jordan, Thank again you Jordan. for this conversation. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you, Thank you Elizabeth. Thanks, Thank you, Audrey. Good Good night. Night. Audrey. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.
Look at the reading. Incredible reading, Elizabeth. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the reading, Elizabeth. We look forward to the zine launch. Thank you, everyone. Hey. Okay. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.